Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the new Startups Podcast. I'm here with Zed and Steven. And, hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, we're going to be doing some good stuff today, going over arguably the most popular way to learn how to program that there is, I think, at this point. So hello, Zed and Steven. What's up, Dan? Hey, how's it going? Thank you. So um, Zed, for the people who don't kind of program out there, it'd be good to hear a little bit, just if you could do uh, kind of a mile high intro to yourself and what you do at this point. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right. So um, basically, I'm a programmer. I've been programming for a real long time. And uh, around 2009, I started a series of books called uh, Learn Python, Ruby, JavaScript, C, like all the different programming languages I can. And it's Learn Programming the Hard Way and uh, Learn Code the Hard Way. And basically, I write these books for total beginners that assume you know nothing and take you from nothing. And if you can actually code when you're done. I mean, assuming you actually get through the book. Um, that's why I call them the hard way because it's kind of, I don't know, it's a challenge for some folks to get through it. But you it's structured and you can get through it and that's it. Do you find that uh, your books are a little bit more difficult than the, the average programming book or something? It seems, it's, sounds not, a little... it's not so much that they're di difficult. It's just that they're different. So other books uh, kind of come from an era when you just threw a bunch of problems at people and then they sank or swam. And so people aren't used to that. That's kind of like how a lot of American schools are done. And mine is much more kind of lockstep, structured and logical, but you kind of have to do what I say. So I think that's the difficulty for it. It's funny because in Russia, the name of my book is Learn Python the Easy Way. So in Russia, I guess they just do it this way anyways. And <laughs> they say it's the easy way to do it. Um, but in the U.S., it's the hard way because they're used to um, what's called a constructivist or Socratic method. So I'm curious. So then like in your books, um, do, do you give people like big problems to work on in the end? Like it seems like, um, or at the end, like it seems like in a lot of programming books, or at least in the little bit that I'm familiar with, usually they're oriented mm -hmm. around certain types of projects where by the end of this, you'll be able to do like a certain thing. Do you avoid that in your book or do you just approach it in a different way? Or um, I approach it in a different way where I give like small, incrementally larger projects throughout. So because I'm starting with total beginners, I can't be like, you know, four exercises in now write a web app. Mm -hmm. So, but four exercises in, I'm like, try to break your code, you know, and then about halfway through, I'm like, here, here's a little game. And it's like a text adventure with three rooms, you know? So by the time you're done, you can do a web app. Um, but also I tell people my books are more like, after you read my book, you can handle another book. So they're the, it's all the material that most other programming books expect you to already know. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, what's your, what's your take on kind of the proliferation of all of the programming schools i think you could say coding boot camps and what have you at this point is that doing a harm is that a good thing uh what type of knowledge are people kind of getting when they're pulling out there do you think that you know does that hurt you at all or, or yeah so what's your, what's your view on all that uh not really it's sort of a compliment to mine and in fact i think what i basically did is um because my books were free initially, I sort of gave those schools their free compliments. So one of the big strategies when you do business and programming is you commoditize your compliment. So if your main thing is selling an operating system, then you want to commoditize PCs, right? And you want to make them as cheap, cheap, cheap as possible. And so the, the sort of commodity to a coding school is coding a curriculum. And I basically created a curriculum that was free. And that sort of made it so a lot of people could start learning and become interested in code schools. And then it made it easier for code schools to kind of exist. So in a way, it's sort of symbiotic. Um, but I think one of the things that I don't like is a lot of schools are pretty predatory and they have a lot of sort of like little scams that they pull to sort of stay ahead. Um, I know one school, uh, they actually got sued. Flatiron School got sued by the state of New York. And they had to pay up like $250,000, $350,000. And uh, it was because they refused uh, refunds and they lied about their placement rates and all that. And then they um, had to be bought by, I think, uh, WeWork. And so, uh, yeah, if you read that lawsuit, that's pretty much every school. Do you, you find that people can, do you hear a lot of stories of people like they go through your books and they're they're getting a job out of that afterwards? Or is that really not the case at this point? Mm, no. So I have a sort of like a new design where by the time you're done, you're you're okay. But my earlier books, no, nah, like when you were done, I was very honest about it. When you're done with my book, you're not going to get a job. Like you basically know the very basic, basic, basics. And then I pointed people at like tons of other books. Right. And I told folks, I was really honest about it. That's why I said it was the hard way. I was like, not 24 hours. This is like a year or two. Um, but some people who already have a background, like if they have a background in math, if they have a background in um, uh, music, literature, actually, surprisingly, um, other languages, 
uh, those folks would tear through my book, tear through two more, and then they'd be off getting a job. So it's entirely based on the individual. Interesting. So um, kind of our, our second thing here, which would be very interesting, is to hear your history, because it's not like you're some guy who sold a company for a billion dollars and then decided he wanted to help people, but you were actually a certified um, wage slave for yeah, yeah. quite a period of time. And you, yeah. So what, what's your what's your history? Can you tell us kind of, you know, where did you get from just a wee long, wee young lassie up to where you are these days? <laughs> wee young lassie. Um, yeah. So actually I, when I was a kid, I was very, very poor. Like, um, we, I was super duper poor. I was a foster kid, like everything. And so my big dream when I was growing up was to get a desk job coding for like $30,000 a year. Like that was my, that was my whole goal when I was younger. And I did that. I joined the army and then I got it, went to college. And then after college I got jobs and, you know, slowly just kept working at different companies and stuff like that. I would, didn't really aspire to be famous. I didn't aspire to do anything other than to just work. But on the side, I loved writing code so much. I just wrote all this open source and I wrote blogs and I just wrote, it was just like I had to. And uh, out of that, it started getting me more work. And then at a certain point, it started like keeping me from getting work. It was kind of weird. Like the more uh, famous I got in open source, the harder it was to get jobs, which is like, you'd think not the other way. It's supposed to be the other way around. And um, yeah, over time, I um, actually was working at Bear Stearns and they collapsed. And uh, I was actually working there for like eight months and they imploded in like a weekend. <laughs> it was crazy. Really? I'm, what I'm happened actually, during all that? Well, I'm actually oh, curious ahead. real quick because um, you mentioned mm -hmm. doing a lot of open source work. Um, so, I mean, it seems today uh, as not a programmer, it seems like the open source community is, is alive and well. And there's like massive, you know, repos mm -hmm. you can contribute to. What um, what years were you doing kind of like this open source work? And was the community anywhere near as large or healthy as it is today? Or was this like a more niche thing? Or uh, So I've been doing open source since I was a kid on BBS since I was like 15. I wrote little DOS utilities and uploaded them to BBS and stuff. And um uh, I only had a computer for about three years then. So from like 12 to 15 and then I didn't have one. And, and then, then when around, I joined the army. Around what years say, are this? Oh, you want to know how old I am, huh? Okay. <laughs> no, uh, no. No, no, just, just so like a rough, are we talking like, is this like I'm in 44, the nineties? and the, Okay. Uh, yeah. So that, no, that'd be eighties, uh, uh, okay, late eighties. Gotcha. Oh man. I think. Yeah. Cause, cause uh, I graduated from high school in 92. Yeah. Um, and then, um, did I graduate from high school in 92? Man. You're a boomer. You're officially a boomer. It's okay. Though. I guess no. I'm in that weird Gen X that uh, that like uh, that tween Gen X. I think yeah. Um, and so no, there was no community. It was all BBSs, and like um, I had to buy floppies in order to install Linux. You know, when I joined the army, I bought a computer. When everyone else was out buying um, uh, cars, I bought a computer. You know, and I put I got like a huge box of floppy disks, mm -hmm. like three and a half inch disks, and uh, and there was seventy two of them, and I loaded Linux that way. You know, so this is pre internet. This is pre. Uh, I had news groups, but that was about it. And then just every over the years, every year I had some kind of thing I wrote, some kind of coda book, some book I went through. Um, once the internet took off, I started publishing online, and it was all like little dumb utilities. I just have an idea and I go try it. Um, I had this idea, I'd try it, I'd have that, and I would kind of contribute, I'd fix bugs, you know. Um, but I think really, um, and then I did a lot of work in Java, that was the time. But I think really, uh, open source really didn't take off until sort of after Java came around. I'm going to say like, uh, uh, so 2000 kind of killed software because, uh, you know, the, all the tech companies imploded. The and then that sort of was... Yeah, that was sort of like a renaissance for open source because people couldn't get jobs. They just wanted to hack on open source. And uh, I think from around 2000, 2008, and I would say um, uh, the modern open source kind of community style came around Ruby on Rails, I want to say around 2006 when that exploded. Interesting. Um, so what was your, so you were going through your history. So you had some jobs. What was the last job, I guess, that you had before you, and, and what happened there? Um, yeah, so I was working at Dropbox and that was terrible. <laughs> why, why was it terrible? Oh, they were awful. They just started, they were total amateurs. It was just, it was bad. <laughs> they were just bad. I couldn't handle it. I was a wuss. I went there and I, I thought I picked the best company and I did not at all. So what, um, wait, what, what, I'm curious though, with that whole thing, cause that's very interesting. Cause so many people romanticize the being on part of the founding team of a company that ends up being worth billions of dollars, mm -hmm. but why? Like what part of that were you like, fuck this, this is how Um, you know, the biggest thing, and I, this is sort of one of my biggest criticisms of both open source and uh, every tech company, especially startups, especially in the Valley, 
is they sort of have this weird mythological love of, I call him Mr. Teflon. It's like some guy who solved the problem 10 years ago and they can't, they don't want to fire him. And those people become toxic and uh, that was just everywhere. And, and it's sort of like, if you go out drinking with the boss, you're never going to get fired, that kind of thing. Um, and so while I was working there, I came out with my Python book and it was, uh, I wasn't charging anyone. And then um, I was kind of like really hating Dropbox. And then um, I found out I just had a PDF up. I wasn't even paying attention. You'll find this is a common pattern. I don't pay attention to how popular I am. And then I find out later, oh, wow, ups, I could have charged for that. <laughs> so it's really common. Mm -hmm. um, but in one year, it had 250,000 downloads of this PDF. And at that point, I was like, oh, wow. Uh, so I started making videos, I started finishing it. I started charging like two or three bucks and that started making me enough to quit Dropbox and uh, kind of just do my own thing. So what is the, pro so you had, you had done this thing. What was the path? So for getting on to kind of the, the next uh, mm -hmm. segments of this is starting a business. So you, you have. Well, wait, well, can I ask a question? I'm actually really. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so yeah, I'm kind of curious because um, a lot of people are really good at doing certain things, um, whether it's playing video games or programming or whatever. Not a lot of people enjoy the aspect of teaching things. Mm -hmm. Why did, did, have you always had like a penchant for like wanting to show people things or did you spend too much time on forums helping people troubleshoot? Like why, why make a book helping other people to code? Like what was the initial inspiration for that? Oh, actually I went to school to study guitar and okay. the teachers are so bad that I had to go get this book. Um, uh, Mickey Baker's J uh, guide to jazz guitar. And, uh, the, I was in jazz classes. These guys couldn't teach at all. They just yelled at you. That was mm -hmm. it. Um, uh, and so I got this book and he broke the, the playing guitar down into 52 lessons and each lesson assumed you know, knew nothing. And as long as you did what he said, you could play jazz. And so I did that over like the summer break for the school. And when I came back, I could play all the chords that they said I needed to know and I could play. And, and, uh, I went to the school, basically I, I, I did okay. I, I found out I was a bad guitar player and that was about all I figured out. Uh, but then when I started working for Dropbox in San Francisco, I had the idea, hey, you know, I think I could write a programming book that does the same thing as this guitar book that carves learning to code into 52 exercises and breaks it down really, really simply. And so in a lot of ways, I'm basically copying this weird guitar book from the 50s. Like not a lot of people know about it. And um, that was where I got into it. And then I sort of got into, I like a really like reverse engineering how people understand things and misunderstand things. So I've always been good at uh, writing documentation, writing software that people can use. I sort of get a kick out of that. Like for me, writing software is much more about um, uh, either messing with people, like I'll do some funny project or sort of like figuring out the way people are really using something and coming up with a new way to do it or an idea and much less about sort of like solving a technical problem. I'm much more into like um, uh, solving a social problem, I would say. Not even social, just sort of like a brain problem. That's really cool. I, um, I've got a music background too and I noticed that... Um... It, it seems like learning music is very much learning how to learn, uh, you know, like breaking things down mm -hmm. into manageable chunks. Like you really have to, if you want to make it anywhere there. So that's, it's pretty interesting. You'd say that. It's interesting. I'm also uh, taught myself to paint and I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. I basically taught myself to paint to kind of prove out the method. Yeah. And it totally works. I basically, I just, re I organized the material in sort of the same way I did all my programming and my music material. And I just went lockstep through like several books that had it and structured to organize and organized exercises. And, you know, it, it's just a method that works really well uh, for getting started. I don't think it works good for like advanced topics, yeah. you know, like if, like if it's really complex things, but for getting your basic skills done so you can then learn the advanced topics a structured, logical sort of like system is the way to go. And I think that's the thing is um, I'm a systems guy. I make, I system, systematize all sorts of stuff. And, and I think all it is, I just applied that same thinking to doing uh, uh, education. So I just systematize education and then break it down, present it to people and it works. Yeah, cool. All right. You were going to yeah. talk about, uh, yeah, starting the business now. Yeah, yeah. So um so you had this PDF and it was popular. What mm -hmm. were the thoughts going through your mind and what are the steps you, you have from this small, like you must have made almost nothing at this point. Like you, you weren't even charging for it at that point or did you start? No, charging for it? So I wasn't charging for it. Yeah. So what, what goes through your mind and you're like, okay, maybe this can be a business enough that you're going to quit your job also. Cause you're in San mm -hmm. Francisco mm -hmm. at this point, things are expensive. You might have yeah. some savings, but like, uh, this is a big jump to make from just having a download off of something. 
right? Yeah, exactly. It, it's huge. And I think the other thing too is um, uh, when I had that and I found out that it was 250 or 350,000 downloads, I posted my web logs, I anonymized them and I posted them to Hacker News. And I was like, hey, prove me wrong. This Python book that I've been re working on has like 350,000 downloads and it got a whole bunch of replies. And then like six months later, that's when all the code uh, academy and all those startups, uh, those code teaching startups started. So uh, I suspect like I sort of proved that there was a market um, because I don't think any of those existed before me. And um, and so that's sort of like, that's where I was like, oh man, uh, I really need to get out there, at least put free material out there and find a way to survive off of it. So that way people don't have to go to these code schools. Because I was really worried that uh, two reasons why I made the book free was one, I didn't want computers to sort of control folks, right? I wanted them to be able to sort of master their their domains and use them for things that they wanted to do. And then also I didn't want the code schools to sort of like take over uh, teaching programming um, because I, I felt like they just weren't really putting enough effort into it and they didn't really have enough care as to how people learned. Can you remind us what the market for learning to program looked like way back in the day of when Dropbox was first starting when you did this? Like how bad was it at that point if you wanted to learn to program? Was it literally you're going to a, a Barnes and Noble or a Borders and picking yeah. up a, an O'Reilly textbook or, or what's happening? Um, yeah. So if you take, say, learn at me, I had no internet when I learned to code. So I had to buy books or, or, or borrow books from the library, mostly from the library. And then as uh, I was at Dropbox, it still wasn't much better. You still had to go get books. All the books were written only for experts. Like there is, I can think of two books that were written for beginners. And if a book was written for a beginner, it assumed it was a kid. So it was all cutesy and had cartoons and didn't go deep into the subjects. Um, so there was nobody doing that. If you wanted to learn to be a professional, you had to either uh, go to school and get a degree. Even that didn't guarantee, guarantee you because all the schools just taught Java or C Sharp. Like there was just no diversity at all. People came out not knowing multiple languages, not knowing any platforms, uh, being, being basically just taught to be work slaves, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's a single computer science department that I can think of that teaches people to be entrepreneurial. Um, if, in fact, I don't think there's a single engineering school that does that. I'm probably wrong. I'm pretty sure there's some, but today uh, for or whatever back, reason, back in those times, back in those days. But I think even now, the vast majority of them are not entrepreneurial. I think you, if you want to learn anything about like entrepreneurial engineering, mm -hmm. you have to either go to like a, an incubator, a VC startup thing, or go to the business school. That, that's actually where I went. I got sick of it, and I basically got a degree in. Um, uh, computer information systems so I could get business experience. And to clarify here, when you say entrepreneurial, are you talking about like the ability to to work on a project and kind of market it on your own and, and do work independent of a major company or? Yes, yes. I think almost every class I had in the business school or the computer science school or the engineering school um, was all about group work. It was very little about how to manage your own projects, how to manage yourself, um, how to organize freelancers, how to do things like that. Um, a very little, I didn't learn, I was in the business school and I didn't learn anything about how do you start a business? How do you go like do your accounting? How do you get an accountant? How do you do like just basic stuff? Um, which would be just a business one oh one. That's, um, um, it's really funny you say that. I don't, I don't know if this applies to everybody. My experience is very limited, but I noticed when working with engineers a lot or developers that it, it it's very strange that, um, it seems like there are people that are very good at working at things and very good at kind of like taking very direct orders. But when you kind of leave them with, with too much freedom or w without enough direction, mm -hmm. things can get very lost very quickly. And um, yes, yes. yeah, and, and I noticed that when you can find that person, like uh, people that I have working, um, you know, like uh, David, I like about Cake and Chat, like people that can um, take some direction, but then can delegate responsibilities and assign people to tasks. That's like a very rare quality in somebody that can also work as like a developer or an engineer. It's really hard to find those people. Yeah, uh, for me, I learned those skills in the army. To be honest, I didn't actually um, learn them in school at all. I, and I went to, and I I did computer science courses and I did uh, uh, engineering courses and business courses. And not a single time did they teach you um, just basically working on your own. And and for me, I think being able to work on your own and complete a project is sort of a precursor to being able to work with others. I don't think it's I don't think they have it right that you have to. Um, that you have to be forced to work in a group or you're going to be a robot is how, sort of how they think. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about um, kind of all the, the, the swath of books that are out there, kind of the four hour, or, you know, the what, X hour work week series of stuff and, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, the four hour work the week. Self, yeah, like the, the, the self-help, you know, just um, do you think there's value in that? Do you think that 
that whole virtual assistant model is is scalable or do you think that it's just designed to sell books I think a lot of that, I mean, if you look, a lot of those things are designed to sell books. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of like a firm believer and sort of a good example of uh, if you uh, want to get ahead or you want to have a life that you like, you have to sort of work hard on your own at it. And if you have the money, yeah, you can pay for it. You can get people to help. You can hire assistants. I do. Like I have people who do copy editing and things like that. But um, if if you follow these things where like they're telling you you're going to be wealthy if, if, with just four hours of work a, you know, a week and I'm kind of like thinking I, I kind of like working can I work more than four you know it's sort of like I don't I don't see you getting any value out of that I think if it's something that's valuable it's difficult right and then if it's difficult it's going to require work and you can't just do it for four hours a week um, and then there's other things too I know other people who are like oh if you just join my open source you can drive race cars like I do and I'm like, well, that guy also got like $7 million from Amazon and has a whole bunch of other things helping him out. And so, you know, it's a lot of luck that they don't tell you about, you know. And I think that's the, the thing is all those books where they're trying to tell you, oh, yeah, here's the, here's the easy way to making money. They don't tell you all the luck they had, right? And, well, there's a lot of survivorship bias in, exactly. in the tech mm -hmm. industry, especially because everyone wants to say, like, I came from nothing. I made it. You can, too. And I think, you know, exactly. to a certain extent, uh, a lot of... <laughs> Uh, yeah, but anyways, we'll, we'll get past that. Um, that, reminds, so, that reminds me a lot of the Bill Gates dropped out of high school, so I should be able to, too, or whatever, you know? And it's like, okay, well, there's right. a million other people that dropped out of high school. And Bill Gates didn't drop out of high school because he was failing remedial English, you know? It was because he was already doing a, a ton of other work on the side that he yeah, didn't yeah. have time for school for, yeah? A, a good example is Bill Gates. So, so his father was a very high power, very powerful lawyer in the Seattle area. The only reason that he was able to make MS-DOS into a business is because his dad sued the good guy who he got MS DOS from, and then he got the rights to it. You know, so his, without his dad doing a lot of legal work for him, he would have been nothing. And that's yeah. an example. You know, and you don't hear about this stuff, of course. You always just no. hear about dropped out of high school, started my startup, mm -hmm. and you can do it too if you weren't such a lazy SOB or something. Exactly yeah. right. And, but me, I'm very honest. I tell people like, no, I mean, I worked hard, but and I really liked it. Uh, but I did get lucky because I stumbled on, I mean, if you think about it, all I did was I copied a guitar book and turned it into a programming book, right? And right, right place, yeah. right time is, is a lot. But right also, place, you right know, time. there's skill, I, I think, also in recognizing that. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't downplay yourself. The fact that, you know, yeah, right place, right time, but you recognize that it was the right place and the right time. And you felt oh, it. so that's the thing. Remember, I, I let it sit for like a year and it had 350,000 downloads. So I actually didn't recognize it until it was like really late. <laughs> so I'm like, this is a common thing. I'm like, oh, hey, I'm going to make this thing. And it explodes and becomes popular. I'm like, wait, why do people like me? And I'm like, oh, this is weird. So so take us on the journey. So we're, we're quitting Dropbox because we want to do this. Mm -hmm. So how do we... And then, oh, wait. And again, can you, just years on all of this, because mm -hmm. the, the time span is, is very interesting. This is around, when did you start working for Dropbox and quit Dropbox? Uh, 2009. And then I quit like probably eight months later. I okay. mean, not very long. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And, all right. Um, and then before that, I was going to that guitar school after uh, Bear Stearns collapsed. And then before that, I was trying to survive in New York. Um, and it was weird because I was trying to do Java, but I became known as a Ruby guy. And then um, uh, David Hanemeyer Hansen, he had some weird presentation where he told Java guys to basically go fuck themselves. And so like the next day, I could not get work. <laughs> it was so weird. And so I was running around New York, like not really getting work. And then I got a job at Bear Stearns. They collapsed and I got a severance. So I turned that into a guitar school and studied and then just applied for a job after that at Dropbox. So that's all like 2008 to 2009. And then uh, I quit Dropbox because I thought I could do the business. And it actually worked. It actually, um, uh, basically what it is, I, uh, the first step was I had the product, I had to finish it. And so I started interacting with people a lot more. Before I just had it uploaded, it was just something I tinkered on when I watched TV. Literally and, just an ebook that was out on the internet and yeah. we could download. So yeah, now was, we have to turn that into it, a business. Yeah, so it was like, it wasn't even on a web page really. It was just hanging off a URL and I would arc sync it up whenever I did more work. And then I told a couple of people in IRC and then it exploded from there. And I had no idea though, because it's not really on a page. Nobody had to register to get it. I didn't do anything. And so what I did is I, I took it more seriously. I uh, fixed it up, I copy edited it and then uh, finished it off. And then I put it up on, uh, uh, there was some publisher or business before any of the Amazon stuff. And I put it up there for paper. And then I charged, uh, I put it on a, a place that would charge for it. And I charged like two bucks. 
And so um, people started paying for it and then, and they were, um, it was still free and you could go buy it. And so folks were just buying it mostly just out of respect. Like they totally didn't have to buy it. And uh, that started basically paying my rent and getting me started. Were you paying out of pocket for the hosting and everything? Was this a big deal back in 2010? Was it bandwidth a little bit more expensive or was it not? Oh, it's a PDF. I mean, it's like tiny, tiny. Um, It was, yeah, no, it was not expensive to host it back then. This is 2009. So, I mean, I was paying like 20 bucks for a hosting thing and I never went over their caps at all. Okay. okay. Um, Yeah, this is not videos. Videos are totally different back then. Like um, uh, videos turned out to be a problem. I actually had to find somebody who would do the hosting for the videos when I started doing that. You didn't just want to put them on YouTube or something at that point? Well, so YouTube then and still now um, has very sort of loose um, rules about how they own your stuff. And the number one rule, I mean, actually learned this from Steve I, is always own your rights. So if you make a copyrighted thing, never put it anywhere where they suddenly have the rights. Wait, Um, YouTube has rights on videos that you upload to their... They have... Yeah, they have a terms of service that allows them to sort of redistribute and do anything they want to your stuff. Now, they don't because I think that would implode their platform if they just started reselling your stuff without some sort of compensation. But uh, this is one of the reasons why they can just demonetize. They can just do whatever they want whenever they feel like it Um, because uh, it just comes down to like sort of – yeah, basically, if you upload it anywhere, read the terms of service because a lot of times they will screw you. I actually got screwed. Um, by uh, Udemy. They took my content and they uh, said they were going to resell it. And I was like, cool. And they made me like a boatload of cash, like 50 grand in one day. So I was happy with them for a bit. And then a friend of mine emails me. They're like, hey, you know, they're selling your course, my $30 course that we're selling for $2. And I'm like, what? And and they go, oh, but it's going to bring you so many users. I'm like, screw you. That means there's people I have to support. (laughs) It's users only benefit you. They don't benefit me at all. Um, and so basically, yeah, if you don't control your content, you can have in the world of copyright, if you don't control your rights, then someone will screw you. That's just the way it works. So, so what was the process, uh, of this? So you first step is you're making a website, you're going to start charging for the PDF. I assume it's no longer free or do we keep that up or how's that work? And, and how do you, yeah. yeah what's the time frame of all this look like? Um, so basically, whenever you do uh, any sort of like book, there's sort of a hierarchy of needs of what people will want. So if you have HTML, uh, people will pay the least for HTML because HTML has been com- completely devalued with um, advertising and newspapers and whatnot. It's like uh, Google and a lot of other folks have done a lot of work to make HTML worthless, basically. So HTML becomes a marketing thing. That's all HTML is good for right now, um, unless there's some sort of other value attached to it, right? Um, then people will pay for a PDF. And it's kind of weird because I basically just run a script and I produce all the outputs. So they're paying extra for me to run a bash script. It's kind of strange, but they do. They'll pay for EPUBs and PDFs. And, but you can't charge much more. So I was charging like 2 $3 and you can get an EPUB and, and a PDF. And then I just found a company that did that for me, right? They're like I just uploaded it. They charged it two bucks. They took their two cents and then they gave people to download, right? Just to get started. And then um, the next thing people will pay a lot for is instructional videos. So there's a lot of content, like if you do a fiction book, things like that, you can't do videos. But when it comes to programming, art, music, anything where like uh, reading about it is not as good as watching people do it. So coding is very interactive. Like watching me actually code helps people sort of understand because I can say, oh, you need to actually put, you need to debug it this way and it, you know, put it in the book and it doesn't make sense. But I can do in two seconds. I'm like, click this button and people see it, right? And so they would pay extra for that. And so once I recorded videos, then I started charging $30. And, um, and then I got picked up by Pearson for publishing. Um, it was interesting because I'd sent uh, Pearson my book, Addison Wesley, and they said, no, everyone thinks it sucks. They sent it to a bunch of PhDs who are like, no, this isn't how you teach programming. And then um, my book exploded and then they came back. They're like, please, please, please. Can we publish your book? And so I was like, okay, but I get to sell it myself. I keep the rights. Um, They optioned it. And then um, I produced, I did all the production so I could control it. And then uh, they only sell it in like the places I can't. So Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, places like that are difficult to get into if you're not a publisher. Is that still the case? I thought you can basically self-publish on Amazon or is that somewhat different than... Yeah, when I started, that was much more difficult. And um, uh, getting into Barnes & Noble and stuff is is pretty hard. Um, they really only want to work with a few uh, big publishers, and there's not, not many publishers left anymore. Um, so independent publishing now is almost all done uh, 
where you basically get your book published in, um, there's companies in China and India that do really great publishing. They'll create your books up and send them straight to Amazon. And then you can basically sell a book uh, for say $40 and cost you two bucks a pop. And the, I have a few friends who do that. So what are, what are the economics of that look like? So I guess getting a little bit into kind of the physical versus uh, digital realm of this type of stuff, mm -hmm. um, selling a book, uh, a digital copy versus selling a um, actual book, how does that profit affect you specifically? Yeah, so that's interesting because um, I have a friend, uh, he writes a book called Two Scoops of Django, him and his wife, and they go the paper route. And the reason why is they originally put the first version of their book up for download and they don't do videos, right? So you can pirate, you can compile a PDF in like two seconds. There's no problem. And so people would actually walk up to him at conferences and be like, ha ha, I stole your book, you know? And I was like, what a, what a jerk, man. <laughs> like, at least keep it to yourself. <laughs> tell me you love my book, you know? Um, incidentally, I have the thing where like, if people tell me they, people feel really bad about pirating my book and I tell them, okay, look, if you just lie to people, tell people you bought it. It's the most awesome book ever. And if you get five people to buy my book, you pay me back more than you, than you're paying me. And people do it too. They go out and they like, if they feel bad about selling my book, I'm like, you know, look, I, I can't say that's a good thing for you to do because, you know, I got to control my copyright, but I can't do anything about it. So just hook me up with some promotion or something. What, what is um, your views, views in piracy in general? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Do you think the laws should be changed? Like what, yeah, what's your view in general on uh, counter uh, copyright? Well, so back to my friend Danny. So what he did is he solved the copyright problem by um, he found a publisher and uh, I believe in India. Uh, they publish his book. They send it straight to Amazon. He sells it on Amazon. It looks like he's a regular publishing company and everything. And uh, I think it costs him, I, I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's like a couple dollars per book and he sells it for like 40 or something, right? And what ends up happening is he's making uh, pretty decent money off of it, but also um, he's limiting the number of people who can get to his book. So that's the trade-off. So there's a lot of people who just won't go buy a physical book. They want to just immediate gratification and have it show up on their Kindle or download it to their computer. And then the second problem is that he can't include videos. And his book definitely would benefit from videos, right? So he would have to raise his price or his cost per book to like around $10 to get a CD added to it or a DVD. So that's the trade-off. Um, and when it comes to piracy, so, you know, my issue with it is I, I sort of don't care if it's someone who's poor or they can't pay for it because they live in a country that's, ba you know, like, um, there's a bunch of countries that banned PayPal and I can't use anything but PayPal. It's um, the fraud amount on anything else is so high. Um, I just can't. I tried using uh, several right, other payments. Yeah. yeah, all those. They, they punish you for fraud, 15 bucks a pop, and they provide zero fraud protection. Mm-hmm. So you get punished for someone else's crime and someone else's incompetence. And then if you get too much fraud, they ban you. So I was getting like, because my book is sort of needed, I was getting maybe like two or three fraud things a week. And I heard of people getting banned after two fraud things. So I think the only reason why maybe I wasn't is with the folks at Stripe. Um, and then I switched to PayPal because PayPal is very good at fraud prevention. Like they suck at everything else, but they're very good at, pay at fraud prevention. And like, PayPal doesn't I, ding you too. If, if there is fraud exactly. or whatever, you don't have to pay. I, there were months where I had mm -hmm. hundreds or there was a month where I had $2,000 once in Stripe fees because somebody did a massive stolen <gasps> credit card charge and then build it back. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, surely there must be something I can do to not have this. And then it's like everybody, you know, shits on PayPal relentlessly and PayPal has its problems. But man, if somebody, you know, wants to do a chargeback on PayPal, I just click the refund button and there's no fee. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So PayPal is very good at how they manage their finances. When I get a chargeback, it's done through an arbitration process. And then I just refund them. It's not a problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think that's easier for some folks. If they want a refund, they just do it through PayPal. I'm like, yep, cool. That refund. And nobody's charged anything. Nobody's dinged. The, it happens immediately. They get it back into their account right away. They even recharge um, the or refund the fee for it. So yep. yeah, <laughs> they refund the fee. Yeah. You know, whereas Stripe is charging me fifteen bucks plus the thirty I'm going to lose. You yeah. know, and it's it's just hardcore. Um, and in fact, I tell people if they're they're like they're going to do an open source project and I let people tip. I'm like, no, don't, because the first thing anyone who steals a credit card does is to go test it on all these open source tip systems. Mm -hmm. 
and they'll like they'll do two dollar charge and then if you do a lot of those you get charged back and then you're you owe 15 bucks on a two dollar charge you know this like could like, collapse a company if you did that yeah and that's per charge too so if somebody does it 20 <laughs> times all of a sudden yep. i want to say when i used stripe i thought it was 30 dollars or 35 dollars a fee because i remember somebody charging back like 10 or 20 and i had like 500 dollars in chargeback fees like okay yeah yeah it's uh, insane and then i think the the big thing I, i'm fine okay so you, I have a product that's fraud prone, right? So that's like porn, um, educational material seems to be, those things are really fraud porn, right? Um, I think the problem though is that Stripe is sort of, um, is sort of blaming me for their failure because it's not hard. Like I would look and I would see that the zip code is totally different from where the dude bought it because I would have his IP address and he'd be like in, you know, some country in the middle of Europe, but his credit card's from California. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, it's not hard. You could do simple GOIP couple simple things you could probably block, block all your fraud i remember for, when stripe for, added on their site stripe finally added to the feature i i, I remember yeah. to what they did, yeah i was about to say to be fair to stripe they recently added uh this mm -hmm. anti-fraud technology well like i remember when i was using it a few years ago they added a new feature and it was like you could check a box to verify the zip code to ask them that when they did the card yeah. and i just remember reading that. i was like wait what the fuck don't you guys do that anyway what i think even do this at the fucking gas station really <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, I, think I don't the, know. I have really bad experiences with Stripe. Ugh. Yeah, the first time they rolled out fraud protection, they're like, hey, if you want, you can use our API to do fraud detection. I'm like, why don't you just do that for me? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't have to, why do I have to call APIs yeah. and use you yeah. to do fraud prevention? I, I could just roll my own code with the free GOIP a, a database and be done with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, back to the original question, um, uh, or one thing that I think you asked me was, uh, what, like when I went to move into making money with the product, one of the things that I ran into the hardest was actually charging credit cards because this is pre Stripe, pre everything. You have to use PayPal and, um, and also accounting for it. So I was originally going to do donations and I found, ran in, I had numerous people who told me, no, don't do donations because you get hit with fraud all the time. And then also it's hard to explain, right? So you go to your accountant or the tax man, you're like, well, people give me free money because I'm awesome, you know? Whereas if you give them anything, you can give them like a PNG that's been customized with a looks like a certificate. You give them anything in exchange. Virtual then, goods. Yes, you can say would people buy PNGs with, with like uh, pony drawings on them in their name. And the IRS is like, eh, all right, it's a trade. And that's that, right? And so that was the main reason I charged for my book. I was really going to do donations. And then I had all these people say, don't do donations. And I just started charging two bucks. And that was sort of like the gateway drug to actually like charging money for my stuff. So now uh, your business is pretty big. I mean, I, I've talked to a few people, especially, you know, very hardcore comp sci guys. And they're like, you know, learn X the hard way because you have a whole series now. It's not just learn mm -hmm. Python the hard way. It's learn everything. It must be strange being one guy and also somehow being, I guess, the most popular programming series of books that there is. It's a very unique situation to be in. And, you know, you just do, I guess, what you love full time at this point as well, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, so um, it is a one man shop. So the thing that I do is I use a lot of programming to automate as much as I can. And then I also, um, I try to use equipment to sort of like smooth out all my production. So uh, that's the key is... Um, I'm willing to pay, say, um, like, for example, I have a sound system uh, by a company called RME. This thing is like uh, $2,700, but it gives me the very best sound and it's easy to process and I do not have to do any audio processing when I'm done. So with my sound gear that I've got, I probably spent maybe about 6000 on sound gear, I save myself uh, probably an hour of audio processing per video. So back in the day, I used to have to do... Um, well, not just audio, but like say 30 minutes audio processing, 30 minutes editing, then another 30 minutes video, then another 30 minutes rendering per video. And if I have to do 62 videos for a book, then just spending six grand is saving me you know, potentially you know, 60, 70 hours. So it pays for itself immediately. And it's all about like if you're running things on your own, it's all about either finding someone you can pay to do a thing for you or writing code to do it. So a lot of my automation, I just automate the living daylights out of everything and also keeping things simple. So originally I tried to write this whole sort of like website to let people do like a full course, like in college. And all I saw anyone doing was logging in and downloading. They didn't do any of the forum stuff, any of the questions, nothing. They emailed me. So I pared it all down to where you, you buy it and then you log in and you download. 
Um, I even got rid of passwords. So I set it up so that you do an email authentication, right? And um, that just got rid of like handling people's password resets. Um, it's all about just carving out, like getting rid of anything that gets in the way of you getting your work done and your basic day. And that's pretty much what I do. So uh, you're a controversial dude, supposedly. I don't know that. You know, um, I've talked to you before, but what's what's that all about? Because like you even on your Wikipedia page, there's even like a section like controversy. And why do programming guys get so mad uh, when you say bad things about their programming language? Like what, yeah. what's happening? And And has that affected your business at all? Um, you know, not really. So uh, the Wikipedia page is funny. For a while there, I was Canadian, you know, I'm like born in Texas and I was in the U.S. Army, <laughs> but like on Wikipedia for like five years, I was Canadian. I think someone was messing with me, right? Uh, but anyways, I don't know why they thought I was Canadian. Um, and so this has actually been something that I've been really, really interested in and also sort of experiencing. And, you know, for me, I'm just making stuff, you know, we're all technologists. So it's all about pushing the envelope of technology. And in order to do that, you have to find out what's bad about technology. You have to have a critical mind towards how it works. And the thing is, is I come in and I'm like, hmm, you know, this thing these people are making kind of sucks. I'm going to make my own thing. Or I'm going to be like, man, that sucks. And people just lose it. They lose it. And I couldn't figure out why. Because for me, if someone comes in and says, that sucks, I'm like, oh, really? Uh, well, what's wrong with it? Can you tell me? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, maybe I can fix this. I can fix that. Like I said, I'm a systematizer. I fix things. That's what I love to do. I love fixing stuff. So I have no problem when people say something's broken. Uh, people do it all the time. They email me like, hey, this doesn't work. I'm like, hmm, yeah, maybe I could drop that and move that over there. Um, but other folks, when I say, uh, yeah, this 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 thing sucks. Why does it do this this way? They take it very personally. And well, I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're under... Uh the the fallout from the things you've said you're you're making it seem like oh some people are upset like you had yeah. you had top posts on yes. reddit on hacker news of people essentially saying you know just hate hatred for you hate, for saying hate, these things hate and that's the part i didn't understand so if all it was was like i say um, python 3 sucks and then people go and write their blog posts and they say he's wrong I'm fine with that. That's discourse. That's how it works. Uh, in fact, there's one person, uh, Evie, she wrote a great blog post. I didn't agree with what she said, but she just went through what I said and disagreed with me. That's discourse. That's what you do. But the people that I have a huge problem with are the people who I say Python 3 sucks, and then they go out and try to destroy my life, try to destroy my business, keep me from making money, write massive screeds about how much of an asshole I am. So and people actually me. try to like hurt you financially yes so wow. there were two i had a friend of mine email me the chat logs from two guys who uh contacted him and told him hey you need to take zed shaw's book off your website and he's like why and they, he's like he doesn't like python strings i'm like wait okay so you're going to destroy someone's life because they don't like strings like, what kind of a pathetic loser weenie are you man like this is like the biggest loser ever like What's next? Like some little kid falls down. You're like, kill that kid. How dare he fall down? <laughs> it's so weird. It's bizarre. And so I tried to understand that. I was actually wondering why. I couldn't figure out why folks sort of just have this very huge, strong reaction. And it's fine for people to not like me. I'm okay with that. Um, I can be, you know, a, a polarizing figure for whatever reason, just because I disagree with some things. That's fine. Um, they can do whatever they want. They can call me an asshole. That's fine. But it's the amount of response. So if I say I don't like Python strings, the proper response are to go, well, you're wrong. The improper response, the over the top response is to send me a hate mail telling me to kill myself and then try to get me fired or try to get my business destroyed. That's insane. That is so insane. I cannot. There's a lot of that, that now. Like there's a lot mm -hmm, of that, mm -hmm. you know, especially I, I guess I would say even in the streaming or, or gaming world is if you mm -hmm. do something wrong, no like way, you really? You think so, Dan? <laughs> you, would you really say that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this affected Stephen here as well. But I was thinking a, a couple more, times. A more prominent case. Do you remember there was that woman who worked for a company and she she made some like bad joke before she got on a plane or something, like saying, mm -hmm. like, I hope I don't get mm -hmm. AIDS or something. And the world went crazy. And when she got mm -hmm. off the plane, it's like she'd lost her job and you know, all right, this other right. stuff. Yeah. So that's it, like I think it's fine to, you know, disagree with people. Right. I think it's totally fine to not like someone for their opinions. I think what what I couldn't figure out was why was there this sudden desire to destroy a person, like completely destroy someone, but also not just destroy them, get together with hundreds or thousands of your friends and destroy them. Right. I couldn't figure it out. And, you know, 
then I started to sort of remember back in the day, I sort of had this thing where um, there was a, a presentation by David Hanemeyer Hansen, where he basically told people I was weird and angry. And I hadn't been doing Ruby for years and I had no contact with this guy. I had no idea where this came from. And I started getting these weird sort of like kill yourself death threats. I'm like, what is this guy's problem? And then I go in the look and like, oh, so David's kind of coming after me. So I started, I had been ever since for a while, sort of like researching open source and how it works and also how the pattern used in open source is very similar to fascism, like the way fascist propaganda is done. Where Really? <clears throat> yeah, it's very interesting. So there's a, a book called The Anatomy of Fascism. It's the best summary of it. And basically it comes down to they, they craft a community. Uh, they imagine some kind of humiliation, right? And they declare someone an enemy. So that enemy created humiliation for you, right? And then they do it. They claim they do it for like nationalism or the community or whatever, but really it's for some sort of like hidden upside. And then they gain power through that, right? And so they try to manipulate people through this pattern. And then when you go and you look at open source marketing, that's exactly the same pattern they use. And so I was kind of like, okay, these guys are fascists. And then I spent a whole year traveling around doing presentations, telling them they were fascists. It was kind of funny because they would invite me to their conference and I'd be like, yeah, this is why you guys are fascists. <laughs> You're like, oh, maybe we are. Um, and then I sort of thought a while and then incidents like this happened where people are going crazy over me just saying, I don't like your software. I'm like, okay, you can, you can not like me, but man, trying to tell me to kill myself because I don't like Haskell, uh, because I disagree with 4chan. I mean, come on, man, like just grow a pair or something like this, to, you know, it's okay for people to not like something you do. And I started to research fascism a bit more and also, uh, narcissism. And so what I started to realize was, um, none of these folks that I thought, I always thought it was the leaders, like the people in charge of open source who were creating the fascist situations. And actually, none of those people would exist if it weren't for a group of insecure narcissists. And so what I've come to realize is there's basically anything that has a lot of rules, right? So uh, classical realism is a form of art with very accurate drawing, programming, music. So if you ever see those guys who are those douchebag shredders who can go 300 beats per minute and they master it. So they think that they should be recognized for their genius because they can play very fast or you know, I'm, I, I know everything about everything in the C programming languages, undefined behavior. So I should be the guy who is famous for C programming, right? So those are insecure narcissists. And if you set up a system where insecure narcissists can come and hang out with you and memorize all your rules and they get power through memorizing your rules, or if you just promise them power, Hey, come join open source, we'll give you power. Then insecure narcissists eat it up. They love any situation where they can become powerful without having to put themselves forward. That's what makes them insecure and they feel entitled to it. So then it's easy to attract them to it. And when I come out and I'm like, yeah, you're not special. Your stuff sucks. They take it very personally because that's how narcissists are. If you look at anyone who's been abused as a child or anything like that, they talk about abusive narcissistic parents. And it's always like, oh, my dad beat me because I stole a yogurt. Right. It's always something very minor and, in, and just insignificant. And you wonder, like, why would anyone do that? So weird. And then you see the exact same pattern with uh, these people who go crazy in open source when they're criticized. They're basically insecure narcissists who love the fascism and you're never going to get them out of it. You can never change a narcissist. And that's the way it is. And then if you criticize them, they just go after you. Now, the flip side to that is there's a bunch of very good people in open source who are not like this. But I think because they stand by and allow that to happen, you can kind of say that they are also sort of guilty of this, right? Me, when I you know, like see these kinds of things happening, I'm like, hey, that's really wrong. You shouldn't do that, right? So for me, it's like this combination of if you allow it to happen and then you allow these insecure narcissists into your system and those people go around attacking others, then you're a fascist. That's just the way it is, right? And if you think that people should be attacked for disagreeing with your community or your group, you're a fascist, right? That's like the cornerstone of fascism. Someone is an, as a them, as an other, and they disagree with you. So then you go out with your buddies and attack them, right? And if you weren't fascist, you'd be like, well, he just disagrees with us. That's all, right? It'd be, okay, that guy disagrees with us. There you go. It feels like one of the big problems with this is that like these types of people, I'm, I, 
I'm not going to say I guess. I'm 100% positive. These types of people have always existed. But it seems like the internet has kind of given you this ability to enact this insanely disproportionate response that no individual person ever feels responsible for. Um, exactly. Like going back, um, I mean, even when I was in school, you know, I'm coming up on 30 now. I can't imagine like doing something in high school that would ruin my life just because there wasn't like the mm -hmm. scale, like online shit, like Facebook was still, I think, invite only. I think you even needed like mm -hmm. a .edu to get in. Gmail was invite only. There weren't these massive, you had your MySpace and LiveJournal. Um, pictures were hard to post. It's like, what you know, the internet was just kind of like a thing and... If, if you did something yeah. really fucked up and somebody posted about it online, you know, that was only going to be read by like the, the hundred or so people maybe that were like in your class. Like that's it. Whereas nowadays and, and each of those people, you know, might be really upset at you and that might suck back then. But that was it. But nowadays when some shit gets posted, fucking everybody contributes their little part. But it's like a fucking tsunami. And by the time, you know, the totality of all of that outrage is collected, you've like effectively destroyed somebody's life. And then because the Internet is exactly. so permanent now and so much larger, you know, that destruction lasts forever and... i was gonna say that's a big thing is that it's permanent now i feel like all mm -hmm. the stupid shit that mm -hmm. uh, we did as kids you know that's not on the internet anymore exactly so. yeah um so it's interesting so in my research on fascism that this you have a, a distinct rise in fascism right right after a new communication model comes out so if you go back to uh, even before world war ii if you look at the book as soon as the book was popular that's when you get the the um, Protestants, Reformations, all those things. And then you go up to World War II. That's radio. So radio is really popular suddenly all of a sudden, new communications. Then TV came out. We had a whole bunch of problems when TV came out. And then when the internet comes out, boom, explosions in fascism. And so it's sort of this thing that basically when you get a new method to communicate, it makes it very easy to get insecure narcissists to join your group. And then it takes people a while to figure out, oh, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe we shouldn't let people just be ranting, raving idiots on radio. Right? Wait a so minute. Or is this that. turning into some modern thing about how Twitter is now this next wave and something there? No, I, I think actually I saw this same pattern before anything like Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. In fact, there's a thing called Godwin's Law. So when the, when the internet was available to mostly just the people in academics, um, there was this thing, Godwin's Law. So the probability that any discussion will mention Nazis approaches okay, one, yeah. 100 as it continues. So this is not nothing, anything new, but those people were sort of precursors, sort of like the, you know, the, the canary in the coal mine that you know, this was a new communication method and it will be exploited uh, to control the masses. And if you're not careful and get in front of it and figure out how to do that in a positive way, then it becomes used for fascism, right? And it's interesting because if you look at television in the US and the UK and places like that, um, they got ahead of it and they actually passed rules and laws pretty quickly to control it, spread it out, break it up, um, make it so that it couldn't be controlled by one group. Um, they got rid of that in 1996, but for a long time, you could not own, you could not have one company own radio and, and TV stations in the same area and newspapers, right? You had that diversity. Um, so they get it did a good job with that. And you notice the television didn't have quite as much of this that you see with like the internet or that you saw with radio when it first came out. Um, and I think that's the big thing. It's not the only thing that causes it, but without that, without like a way to communicate with these people, there's really not any chance that it'll happen. Makes sense. So um, do you try to stick away from saying things like that that are going to rattle people? Like, are you scared to come out and say, you know what, rust is not needed or something like that? Oh, no, I say that all the time. Um, okay. you know, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, no. Um, well, at first I was kind of scared um, when they went crazy because what I said about Python 3 was pretty normal. I said, you know, it could have been better done. I don't think it's run right, and I think it's marketed wrong. It's super weird, right? And it wasn't like I was saying, um, you know, like all the people who, who there have sex with goats or anything like that. I was just saying like technical arguments, right? Just basic technical arguments. And the reaction I got was so scary. I was like, wow, this is weird. And then I was worried it was going to collapse my business. But then what happened is my sales went up. So I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> I guess they can't do anything to me. Um, so now, and, and I've always been critical of programming languages because of this attitude they have of sort of lying to people and using this weird marketing pattern that's straight up from like the Nazi party um, to promote their stuff. So I've, ne I've always been critical of it. Um, but I can take what I dish out. So people are critical of me and I'm like, okay, yeah, you're critical of me. And I think now it's actually gotten to the point where I'm secure enough in my business and what I do. And there's enough people who emailed me and contacted me and said they appreciate the fact that I'm critical 
that I actually do want to start a, a more formal kind of criticism of the programming industry and programming languages and how projects are run. I'm kind of curious because um, a lot of this reminds me. I, I I don't remember the exact issue. I'm sure both of you remember this. Um, there was a massive project where there was a guy contributing it. Um, for, for the record, I'm I'm like a socially progressive pr person, right? Like I vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. I'm anti-Trump. I'm very pro LGBT. All of that yeah, stuff. Me too. Um, however, um, one thing I, I I thought was very strange was that there was a um, there was a contributor to some repo who had. Who, who had said, I guess, some transphobic or homophobic things on Twitter, and people were saying that all of his contributions needed to be removed, that his code shouldn't be valid anymore. Dan, do you remember what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? This is a... Uh, I'm going to have to Google for oh, it. Oh, man, this was such a big... There were so many people that were... Um... They were upset about this, where they were basically saying that all of this guy's contributions needed to be removed. I, I, I found that trans, transphobic maintainer should be removed from project. Uh. From Ella Shito. Uh, this is for Opal. Are you familiar with that? What that is, Zed? Yeah. Oh. Did you? Did, yeah, so. did either of you ever hear about this? I thought I felt like this was a like there were a lot of people talking about this at the time that people were going to start vetting people's like social media background to see if they should accept their code contributions or whatever for projects. Okay. <laughs> uh, it might have. Um, it might have had to do. You said Opal. Is that like? Is that based on Linux or is that like one of the? Uh, I sent the link in there. Is that what you were thinking of, Steve? I can't I can't click anything in Discord right now because it'll mess everything up on oh, screen. Oh, shit. Okay, never mind. Sorry. I was wondering if you guys had heard anything about that or not. Okay. Um, Lin Linux developer who took on Linus Torvalds over abuse quits toxic kernel community. Is that did your mic uh, come undone there? Yeah, yeah. Give me a second. You oh, can no, hear I can, me, right? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, so I'll, I, can't you pull this one up? Don't you have the thing for the, the screen, Steven? Oh, I mean, um, I just can't click a link you send me, but I can. Um, what's your article? Okay, yeah. For some reason, uh, yeah, it's cutting out now. Yeah. In and out. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. I'll just leave it at. The... Wait. I'm in the dark for dramatic effect. It, it it's cutting in and out now for some reason. Uh -oh. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Okay. Can I you told you this was a better? professional podcast. No, right? I know. I do this professionally. Oh, I should man. be able to do this better. What was it? A six thousand dollar audio? Yeah, yeah. It's, they're very complex. Okay, how's that? All right, just stay there and don't move. All right. We're we're almost um, through this. So so, anyways, yeah. Uh, this issue here, running down this one. The title was "Transphobic Maintainer Should Be Removed from the Project." So people actually wanted uh, this person removed, and they wanted all of their past um, code contributions removed because of this. I don't know if this is more prevalent uh, now. I mean, it certainly seems like it is now, especially with anything having to do with gaming, anything having to do with programming. This seems like anything online. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, this yeah. Sure right now is certainly, I don't want to say the Me Too movement, but if you say something that's, you know, going the wrong way, they are trying to delete your existence from the internet and make sure that you can never feed your family again, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, so it's sort of complicated because one of my problems with open source, that there are a bunch of these total jerks who get in on it and they get into it to control it. So I do think there has to be a code of conduct. Um, it's just that I think that the reaction who violating the code of conduct is just way beyond the pale, right? Like it's not moderate. And you really only see that when people are kind of abusive people, you know, I'm fine if you're going to do, um, you know, if you're going to go after someone for being truly evil and disagreeing and whatnot, but, you know, destroying someone completely uh, for kind of minor violations in a lot of ways is actually sort of, I don't know, I just think it's just abusive. Um, instead of like having a formal process and doing it very, you know, calmly and whatnot, um, I think it's just uh, too much sometimes, you know. And now that being said, like, yeah, if your project is, I don't know, if they are very for trans and you get in there talking a lot of trash about people who are trans, well then, hey, you suck, man. You're gone. It's it's don't join that project. You go. I guess my I guess my kind of issue with it, um, the the scary thing for me, and this is kind of how I've always felt, is that when I when I think of things. Uh, about like um, being held accountable for your social media. I guess I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that a company 
that's not paying me 24 seven can go and find things that I've said, like not on the clock and, and then try to hold me accountable for it. You know, uh, that, that's, that's something that I've always been not okay with. I guess maybe contributing to open source projects is a little bit different, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, like if I'm not like the face of a company or if I'm not like the CEO of a company or something, I don't know. I guess I'm just a little uncomfortable with that, that, that kind of idea that all of my social media and every single thing I say can get me fired or removed from a project or a job at any point in time. Yeah, I think that's actually, um, I think that's, that's another thing. And so I have no problem with the criticism of people who you disagree with. I mean, that's discourse, that's free speech, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people criticize me all the time. Yeah. Um, but it's, again, the response. So if someone has uh, the, some something they say you don't like, then you respond to them by saying something and just, you know, talking to them, right? What I don't like is this sort of behind the scenes abusive destruction of somebody, right? When they've done nothing really to you or anyone else. But also, uh, I think one thing I really don't like is if you got a problem with that person and then you sit there and you let someone who's a leader of the group do the exact same thing, then you're basically a massive hypocrite, right? So if you're taking an underling and you're basically destroying his life for an opinion he has outside the project, but then I know that the guy who runs your project is also like a massive sexist. He violates the rules all the time. He is totally against the code of conduct and he, you know, you back him, which I've seen over and over, then that's where the real problem is. And I can think of a ton of projects where like, I know, I know of projects where people told me rumors about terrible things the leaders do. And then on Twitter, they're like, oh man, I'm super woke and I totally hate Trump. And, and then I'm like, I know that guy is like, I think, I think he's a really bad dude. You know, and yeah. just like, and then you'll see people who are followers of the project or followers of this group or followers of that, the, in order to show like how good of people they are, they'll go after people who are kind of minor, you know, like they're easy targets and then ignore the things that the leaders do. Right. Well, there's a lot of that now. Like, uh, I was just sent an article, like, so what's your, your take on them removing master and slave terms from, from Python? This was about a year ago, wasn't it? Or is it even that old? Uh, um, yeah, I, that comes up. I mean, people, people, uh, change their language. They change their standards, you know, uh, if they have a process for that, then fine. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, if, um, if someone comes in and they say, Hey, I don't like this whole master slave thing. We should change it up. And then someone in the project who's like, you know, top person and should never be questioned loses it. I'm going to say that dude's a fascist. Like you can discuss it. You say, well, hey, why do you want, why do you want to change it? Like, okay, well, yeah, I think it's not too hard. We could probably just do a grep, change everything in the files from master and slave to two other words, and then you're done. It's not a big deal. But I think a lot of these people, anyone who's like, I hate codes of conduct, I'm going, why? They go, because it's wrong for them to show up and change my stuff. I'm like, okay, you're a fascist. You set up an us versus them. You've created it so that anyone coming in and questioning how you, the grand Pumba of the project runs things uh, can't be questioned. Anyone questioning that is your enemy. And then you don't, you try to say everyone, hey, we're an open project and everyone can show up, but you aren't. You don't punish people in the leadership who violate your code of conduct. And when it comes down to it, you do sort of like token things, but you don't actually really care about anyone in the project. Interesting. Uh, well, we got a little bit uh, <laughs> off topic yeah. here on, on that. Um, so to get back a little bit on here, so where you stand today, arguably the most popular learning, uh, sorry, method to learn how to program online, certainly I would say the most well-respected. Um, what are the plans that you have moving forward? I think right now, how many languages do you currently cover? Uh, I actually lose count. So I do Python, Ruby, C, um, working on JavaScript, uh, two Python books, actually, Python, Ruby, C, JavaScript. Uh, those are the languages. I'm doing a Unix book and I have a short course on Vim. So I teach kind of random things and then I do d online live teaching. And so, uh, before, so let me, just curious actually, be yeah, before, cause we mm -hmm. actually skipped over this cause we went right into the controversy thing. Um, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Wow. It's the lighting. It's the lighting. It makes you want to talk about evil. This feels yeah. really deep. <laughs> Yeah, we're pretty a little <laughs> more dramatic than I expected to be on yeah, yeah. this show. Um, but you, uh, earlier, you keep, you keep referencing that you kind of like missed what, what you thought were pivotal pivotal moments, or, or you kind of missed some opportunities, or you're a little late on yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And going back and looking over everything, you know, everybody has the fantasy that they could, you know, be 20 again and do everything over. What are kind of some things that you took that that you did really well, and some things that you did really poorly that you wish you could change? Like, what what are some of your like best mm. successes, like the the best decisions you made, and then some of the things that you wish you would have been a little bit different on 
Um, yeah, so I, I think the one thing that I'm uh, sort of really proud about, I was able to carve out a niche that's successful in the programming world without sort of compromising who I am, mm -hmm. right? So I may, I, I put it out for free. I helped a whole bunch of people like I wanted, uh, like about 20 million people read my book. And I'm really, really proud of that. And I, you know, stuck to it. And I said, you know, I could charge folks, but I really wanted just to help as many folks as I can, you know. And I also did it with humor. I didn't like dumb down what I talked about. I didn't, uh, I didn't suddenly become all worried that people are going to judge me. You know, I still got on Twitter and told people to, you know, go to hell all the time and sort of was myself. And because I was honest about who I was, everyone sort of was like, eh, that's just how he is, you know. And the people who actually appreciated my work had no problem with who I was, right? Um, the thing that I probably should have done differently is taking it more seriously as um, a business. And uh, honestly, I think what I should have done when I came out and saw that it was 350,000 downloads, I should have kept that a secret. And I probably should have turned that into an online education business right there and probably should have started looking at, okay, well, how can I turn this into a business? Um, but at the time I was kind of more, I was, I was just motivated by different things. I was motivated by, you know, helping folks and getting it out there. And I just didn't think I was a writer really of, uh, programming books. I just thought I was a programmer. I'm just gonna put this out. I'm never gonna make money on this. And then sure enough, it turns into the, the thing that I'm actually better at. I would say I'm a, I'm a better writer of these technology books than I am a programmer, honestly. Oh. Do, do you I'm just and then kind of just curious to kind of wrap that up i'm just curious mm -hmm. um it, it always seems like there's um when you read a lot of stories of people that there's always like one kind of weird thing that happened that like if this thing hadn't had happened nothing else would have fallen into place do, do you think that the like that jazz guitar music course that you took do you think that that was like kind of the, the big initiative for this like had you not done that book would, would none of this have happened or do you, do you think you would have found your way yes. to this anyway um, no, actually, I think if I hadn't gone to that school and uh, sucked so bad at it, mm -hmm. right, like sucked so bad at guitar, jazz guitar, and keep in mind, I'm a super nerd, right? Like I'm a huge nerd. People think I'm cool. I am not cool. I'm like the least cool guy there is. Like it's, I'm a super dork. And so for me, like I'm in this jazz school with all these like cool rock star guys, you know, they got long hair and they're super this wailing and I'm all like, beep, 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 I don't get it. Mm -hmm. So if I hadn't have been like, hey, I'm a nerd, I read books, and gone and researched and found that book, I would have never sort of stumbled onto this education method. And I was like, why does this work? This is so much better, right? Um, so yeah, if I hadn't found that book, none of this would have happened. I, I totally owe Mickey Baker so much. And uh, like his, his music is really cool. Um, and yeah, it was totally that. Cool. Okay. What are you laughing about, Dan? You're over there laughing. No, I made the mistake of reading chat. I have to get back to okay. So uh, plans for the future. Um, the easy what I like to ask people, you know, even my friends and and everyone else when they're trying to get an idea of their their business stuff is, um, where do you want to be in one year from now? Like, let's say things are perfect for you. Where are you going to be in one year from now? And where are you going to be in five years? From now? Um, and, and like real answers, like it, you would be so thrilled if this was the case. Don't have to be realistic. Like just really where you want it to be. Um, you know, if within one year, I really want to get this sort of um, art education setup going, right? So I would really like to be able to teach people to paint in the same style that I taught programming. That's my like one year goal. And then within about five years, sort of um, be able to have um, enough of a stable of books and resources teaching people that I can start maybe working on a, a new business not related to teaching at all. I think that's my five year plan. Um, but ultimately, and then when it comes to art, I actually think I want to start trying to pursue the art angle. So, you know, um, you said getting shows, doing things like that. That second thing you said, you said pursue a business not related to teaching. Did you have something specific mm -hmm. in mind there or just? Uh, yeah, you know, within the art world, they're just woefully inadequate when it comes to tech. And I think there's like a whole bunch of just random things from programming that I could bring over to art that would just completely revolutionize it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, uh, I have ideas and I tend to be very, very early with them. So I never really revolutionize anything. I just sort of show up and like, this would be cool. Mm -hmm. And then five years later, someone else does. So I think that's just my goal. What, what about goals as far as business sense? Like, do you have a certain like, um, you know, you want to have like 10 people working for you? Do you still want to be the only employee? Like anything on that? Are you completely happy with the work structure you have in place? 
Um, you know, I would actually not mind having people working on this, but it's a weird business because it kind of is a one man show. Like, um, I've tried uh, recruiting other authors to write books and they want very weird terms. Like they want total control and they can tell me to go to hell and they basically steal my, my organization, but then I get nothing out of it. And it's just difficult to actually hire folks to do just about anything. But wouldn't that um, be the natural progression of your business? Like, yes, mm -hmm. it is. Like, there's so many companies get stuck at this point because they're unable to go and, and hire and train someone to go to the next level. It's so mm -hmm. common in pretty much every industry is that especially things that start as a kind of a local, I don't want to say local, but like a homegrown startup. And it's like, you're doing yeah. everything and you don't hire anyone and you're going to, you're going to plateau at this point. And if you want to grow, let's talk realistic with me knowing nothing about your business. I'd say, if you want to grow, you mm -hmm. have to hire someone who's like the dedicated C guy, who's just going to fucking kick ass at C and you need to hire a dedicated mm -hmm. guy who's going to do this and that. So is that not the case? And is there no goal there? Or it's totally the case. But, um, the thing is, is in order to do that, there would either have to be an infusion of investment money. So I would have to go and get investing, right? Uh, cause hiring people cost money. Like, you know, if I wanted to hire, say like two or three people for the year, we're, that's like what, three or $4 million if you pay them a regular salary. Well, it's, and it's then, the, it's the goal of being able to do it sufficiently as you go. Like, don't you think you would have to identify something you think like if I get right now, I don't have a course on assembly, you know what? And mm -hmm, if I mm -hmm. got this guy, he's not the best assembly guy, but if I, if I trust him and he does it, I think I'll make more than I spend on him. Then that's not losing money. You're just like, no, you're taking a bet on that. Right. Um, but that for whatever reason, it is really difficult to get programmers to write in this style. It's a lot of training on my part. It's actually easier for me to just write the stuff. So if I were to hire people, it would be in, in secondary things. I already hire someone for copy editing. Um, uh, I do a lot of the audio and video myself, uh, cause it's not complicated. It's a screencast. So I would probably hire someone for that, uh, hiring people to handle my tech support, but even that's really low. Like I've done a good job of keeping it low. I think the thing for me, if I were to hire folks, right would be in um, if it was a push towards a bigger educational setup where it was more like a school and the school was run a certain way and I had other teachers and they taught with, online with me, that would be the direction to go if I were to hire folks. Uh, but as far as my business, I can do it all myself. Um, it's if I wanna push it in a new direction, right? Um, and it's sort of like I am the blocker on the books, but in a way I'm the reason people buy the books, you know? So it's like, I'm it's sort of a cult of personality, you know, it's sort of like, if you're asking um, some famous rock band if they could just outsource the music to someone else, right? It just doesn't work. But everything on the side, right? All the production stuff I could push out if I had the money. No, no, that that's absolutely true. But I, I, I look at. Are you? Do you watch any? Um, you seem like a pretty computer savvy guy. Are you familiar with someone like called Linus from Linus Tech Tips? By uh, no, not really. No. So he's he's a popular YouTuber, and essentially what he's done is he introduces more people into the work. Kind of, I don't want to say as side characters, but if people mm -hmm. who will come onto the videos and do things as that, and these things end up spinning out uh, into their own products as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would just you know it's interesting. I mean, the natural way, as I said, me not understanding your business would say the way to expand would be to have more courses of mm -hmm. the same quality coming yeah, yeah. out. Or even like roughing uh, a guy in like in a book, like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how they're structured, but if you have like example projects, like having those being written by another person as a way to introduce mm -hmm. them to an audience and then a book and then having them eventually spin off into their own books is. Right. Yeah. So, um, I was going to do that with two books and I, I just, I tried to get a guy to write a book and then, um, he just totally failed at it. And the big thing for him was, uh, recording the video. Mm -hmm. So then I went with, I got two or three people to come in. And I was like, look, you write the book, I'll do the videos. And uh, the copyright and the contract behind that was just heinous and they could not agree to it. So they just would not do it. So if I do the next version of that, what it's going to be is I'm going to put together the structure of my books. I'm going to have it there and I'm going to hire a ghostwriter and be like, convert this to go. And that's going to be it. And they're going to get zero rights. I'm going to pay them a flat fee and be done with it. Um, because that seems to be the only way to do it. And like I said, uh, there's a lot of people who really desperately want to be famous for having written a book like this. And when I tell them, yeah, but like, you can't really sell the book. I have to sell it for you. It sort of gets really weird and they don't want to sign any contracts or do anything about it. I think it's possible to find the people you're looking for, but it, it is a lot of work. I mean, um, I, I used to do, 
I, I used to do like um <laughs> this sounds really dumb like video game lessons video game training um but but I mean coming mm -hmm. from the music background like I, I'm I'm pretty sure that we view this very similarly and that I see a lot of other people that kind of give like people that are really good at things don't understand the process of becoming good at them at all they think that just because they're yeah. good you know they want to take a beginner and they go oh well <laughs> just do like all of these things that I do and you know I'll help you do all the things that I do and you'll be really good and it's like well no you have to walk way back to the beginning and show them you know in baby steps how to go through the fun fundamentals one at a time mm -hmm. so um I, I totally empathize with the difficulty in finding somebody um to, to, to kind of also understand that uh, i think yeah, they're out I, there though and i think that's dan's frustration it's like it's the difference between kind of like growing um i, I don't know like geometrically versus exponentially is when you finally start mm -hmm. hiring out other people and get more comfortable offloading onto them is when you really like explode uh, i guess in terms of your earnings potential and whatnot but i mean it ultimately yeah. comes down to what you value at the end of the day too um you know one thing about that is um it's also a factor of money. So like I support myself really well, but not enough to really hire people on this weird middle ground. So that's why it would have to be like a loan or some investment, because if mm -hmm. I had the money, then it wouldn't be a problem for me to hire other people to manage the authors that write the books. So I could hire dedicated lawyers, copy editors, publisher type people. Right. And those people are not very expensive. They're not like programmers where like they want 300,000 a year. They're happy with like lower pay and they love making books, and they know how to do this production stuff. For me, it works because I'm the only person who does it, so I don't have to coordinate with someone else. But the second you got to wrangle some other editor, some other writer, it becomes work. And so if I were to expand out, I would have to hire people to manage the authors. That's what I'm learning. Um, I guess let's drop into some viewer Q&A, uh, if that's all right with you. Yeah, totally. Go for it. With you, Stephen, unless you have anything else? Um, no, I mean, I think that's good. Yeah. All right. We're going to go through these. Uh, I'm going to try and get rid of some of the shit ones. Um, <laughs> okay. I know you're uh, there laughing at something someone said. It's, well, there's a lot of, to show me later. <laughs> there's a lot of, yeah. Okay. I do. So this is hosted on my, so just a background. I do a lot of very, very heavy political content. Um, it's like a big mm. thing. So the, the oh, sides, no. the side content into fascism or whatever is something that is obviously very relevant right now, um, in U S yeah, yeah. politics. So we do a lot of diving into this. So there's a lot of people kind of memeing or joking about just stuff really. That's basically it. Mm -hmm, yeah, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's sort of interesting uh, on that fascism side. Um, I was actually in like 2010. Oh, I'm sorry. You're my cut out for a second. You were what in 2010? Uh, yeah, so on the fascism part of things, I mm -hmm. actually sort of saw that rising within programming communities in 2010. And so when I saw it rising in the American political spectrum, I was like, oh, we're screwed. This is totally going to work. And then I saw it working and working and working. I was like, we're screwed, we're screwed, we're screwed. And I was telling all my friends, like, no, no way, no, going to win. And I'm like, nope, he's going to win. You watch. He's doing everything. And I would try to tell them. And I'm like, here's the marketing pattern. They would just totally ignore me. Mm -hmm. And then sure enough, it worked. Yeah. Well. Just don't go full Scott Adams, okay? I don't know if you follow this stuff at all. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, I'm very against, uh, just to make sure, I'm like you, I'm very progressive, yeah, and yeah. I did, did not vote for Trump, and I'm very against anyone who's doing fascism or racism. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Okay, right, so are we are we off the politics stuff? Oh, my God, you guys are always <laughs> grabbing. Okay, all right. So what's the what's the uh, Listen, what's the I got some real good questions. Yeah, hit okay. us up with those good questions, Dan. Yeah, give, give us the Q&A. I feel like the website programming motherfucker is laden with hyperbole. Is that a correct oh, yeah. assessment, Zed? Or do you actually believe planning tools and methodologies, for example, Jira support, XP, Scrum, have no place in software development because it changed developers? If so, how do you meet release dates and customer commitments without said planning tools, planning tools, just not to commit to anything? I hate that planning shit too, and I wish all I would do is code and design work, but I accept their use and place in software development so long as the management of it is not bad. Ah, okay, so yes. So first off, programming motherfucker, uh, it was actually a joke because I gave a presentation in Utah and I told everyone, here's how this uh, fascist marketing pattern works. And they like, and then on Hacker News, my, my presentation got up and they're like, nah, you can't do it. And I go, watch. So I went in and I took a slightly popular blog post, I turned it into programmerfucker.com. And if you look, I'm using the fascist propaganda technique. Go read the page. It's like, we are this, they are them. It's all that technique. I create a community and we've been humiliated by that. It's like straight up out of the playbook. And I posted it to Hacker News and it went jump to the top. And then the people who are at the conference are like, wow, uh, okay. 
But then it sort of took on a life of its own. And I started getting invited to debate people at agile conferences about this joke <laughs> methodology. And if you look at the methodology, the methodology is you make a list of stuff and then you do each part of the list and then you make sure that it worked. I mean, that's the, the simplest methodology you can. It's not even a methodology, right? <laughs> It's, it's, it was totally a gag that just took on a life of its own. Um, however, I do believe uh, that tools like Jira and a lot of these other management tools are sort of, um, they're designed for managers to not do their jobs. So me, I think, uh, for example, go look at Jira, any kind of Jira thing, and you see it's like 40 fields. Like people fill out crazy fields in it, and not a single one of them is being used to manage anything. So uh, the easiest thing to manage is a shared to-do list of stuff, and you don't find that anywhere. Uh, when I do uh, project management or I do my own work, it's mostly just a to-do list. That's really all you need. So something like a Trello will work instead. Um, what I find with a lot of the agile methods, a lot of the management methods, a lot of these other things, is that they try to control personal process with team process. And that's where I think the, the problem is. It's not that you shouldn't have team processes as an organization. It's that your team process shouldn't infringe on your personal process for getting your work done. That's where it becomes abusive. So for example, pair programming. So if someone is telling you, demanding that you have to always forcefully pair with people, right? Then that's basically a chain game, right? Like, think well, here, I got game. a question for you on that one while uh -huh. you're saying. Go for it. What is the negative connotation with forced pair programming? I always thought it as a good way to crank out a complicated task with a diverse perspective. Uh, the negative connotation is they, the people who came out with Agile were sort of doing a, what I call Mott and Bailey. So a Mott and Bailey is a, where it's a rhetorical technique where you put forward some sort of like untenable position. Uh, I love, we go over all alone. of this stuff. I love this. This is my favorite, right. uh, this is my favorite guest ever. Yeah. Yeah, so, so a Mott and Bailey is you go, programmers are robots who if left alone will never talk to anyone. They'll be in the basement, cowboy coders. And you go, I don't know. I talk to people all the time, man. Like I just kind of work with them when I need to and I ask for help and they go, uh, yeah, but I mean, what I mean is if you pair, then uh, you have the best communication. That's right. So the thing is, is forced pair programming is you are forced to do it all the time. Whereas there's no research that shows that that's better than just letting people collaborate the way they do all the time. So just let them pair. If they're in the same room, they're going to pair, right? This is mm -hmm. the way it is. It's, it's sort of rude to say that I'm going to just be a robot, right? But then the flip side to it is there are a ton of things that you sort of just have to have solitude and sol and like calm to work on your own and not have someone yelling in your ear, you forgot a semicolon, you forgot a semicolon. Like every 10 seconds, most paragraphing is someone just looking at the text that are turning stuff red and going, you forgot that. The, just to, you, you for people look. that don't know in chat, because I didn't know and I just wikied this, I, I had made the assumption that pair programming was like two people were assigned to the same task or something, um, but, but I just looked it up because I was curious. Pair programming is an agile software development technique in which two programmers work together at one workstation. One, mm -hmm. the driver, writes code, while the other, the observer or navigator, reviews each line of code as it is typed in. I feel like I would kill myself if I had to do yep. this. Yes. Yep. <laughs> this sounds like the, so, I don't know anything about programming, but this honest to God sounds like the worst fucking idea. This sounds like some shit. Awful. Oh my God. But this is how much like Silicon Valley is like, has this stuff fed. Like, I, I don't understand. Yeah. Well, um, so be, it's interesting for a second. because um, in a junior programmer situation, like a training situation, this is very, very good. Right. So mm -hmm. you let the junior run the keyboard and you instruct them, but uh, I'm a professional. So if I'm going to use Vim and code with my tools, all that matters is I got the job done, right? And that's where I say, like, if you come in with your team process of I got to use Eclipse and Jira and uh, code with this guy who didn't shower and just yells at me for red squigglies on a text editor, then you're just killing my productivity, right? The other problem is the stated goal of that stuff is to make me work way harder than I would want to normally. So there, that's why it's a chain game, right? Yeah, um, well, I think there's... Yeah, go ahead. Sam. I was going to say, to be fair, uh, j just on, on the little bit that I talked to devs now, it seems like... This seems like some really, uh, I feel like programmers today in, in their work and like the larger companies generally have more freedom than it seems like they used to at least. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. where like you're, you're typically allowed to work on your, I know at least for Facebook, because I have a friend now that I, and I got to wa watch how they were working. And I, I was always under the assumption that these guys are all like cubicle dudes, but it seems like they're a big fan now of like, and I think Google does this too, where you've got open campuses, people kind of choose mm -hmm. what they want to work on. You're not like hardcore restricted to a certain schedule and you just get kind of like your bi-yearly reviews or whatever, where they kind of make sure, or your half year reviews or year reviews to make sure that you're yeah. kind of like working on stuff and whatnot. That, that seems to be the way that people, larger people at least are going. 
Do you remember? Also, do you remember ahead, for a, I said, do you remember for a while everyone was pushing these open workspaces where it was like complete cancer to get anything done? Hey, like that's what Facebook. Worked. Facebook has an open workspace. Yeah. I don't know. It looks really nice, man. And no one there. <laughs> it I looks good in about pictures. It. You don't think? You, you don't think that you're not enough. a fan of that? No, that's absolutely. I would. I'd rather work personally. I'd rather work in a cubicle than, than an like, open workspace. Really? Yeah, where I have like ten dudes like sitting next to me. No thanks. Well, that sounds. I mean. But but Dan, you have the headphones for it. You have the oh, headphones for yeah. the open workspace. It just sounds it sounds like a nightmare. And God forbid I click the wrong Reddit link or something like that and my life oh, is yeah, over. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's you. one thing I tell people is you have a separate computer for work and nothing personal is on that computer. Like for always sure. bring it to work. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, and also I think as you mentioned, this has changed and I think that's the difference is uh, the Agile stuff was created for people who are consultants, and consultants aren't working on anything that has a direct impact on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So they're just working on someone else's stuff. And I think the big change that you see is that programmers are working for companies that have stock options. And so if the company succeeds, they succeed. So it's much easier to get them to be motivated to work on things. You don't have to have someone babysit them constantly. Mm -hmm. The, uh, uh, since... I was just reading some of the, uh, there are a couple of huge Reddit threads that got posted on that programming motherfucker website. Um, I, I, <laughs> some of these comments are very cute. Um, we, the, one of those top level comments is the, uh, become a programming motherfucker part of the site actually has a lot of good resources. And then the guy beneath him says they are good resources. The learn X, the hard way is excellent for beginners. I'm a huge fan of that author. And I guess the guy doesn't realize <laughs> that you're the one that actually wrote the site. That's cute. Um, yeah, so one thing I want to do with that is um, I, now that I'm sort of like getting close to the end of one of my books, I sort of want to do like a, a live show with, called the Progmofo Show, where basically I just rip people's code and I talk about tech and stuff like that. You oh, know, did you, you like, need more haters on the internet? Is that? Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like it's working for me because they find my stuff and they're like, oh, that, that book is really great. <laughs> so I'm going to go for it. Which of uh, Which of your books do you think would be if someone just wants to start programming, what's the one that you recommend? What language? Um, so I, I sort of have this thing where I say, like, it totally doesn't matter, right? So it's sort of like if you get your kid a bike, it's the first bike doesn't matter, right? It's just that they learn to ride a bike, right? And then after that, they can get a better bike and a car and whatever. So what I tell folks is, if you have no money, my Ruby book is free. So just go learn Ruby. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, the book is, the Ruby book is really similar to the Python book. So don't spend the 30 bucks. Uh, just go read the Ruby book. Um, people do just fine doing Ruby. It works. It does all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I tell folks, if you're in sort of like science or things like that, you have to do mathy stuff. Python is sort of like the big thing right now for doing that. So go ahead and learn Python. But um, I really think uh, soon my JavaScript book is going to have the best design. So all the stuff I've learned from teaching online live is going to be packed in this book. It's basically going to be, I have a book that's learned Python and learned more Python. And it's those two books combined, streamlined, a lot cleaner, and with uh, all sorts of extra things, like uh, just um, all sorts of concepts I came up with on how to teach it even better. So I'm actually, once that book is done, I'm going to push it as the book that you should learn. Because when you're done with that JavaScript book, you're going to be basically a, a, a pretty competent programmer. You learn algorithm, build tools, you learn how to build all kinds of things. Um, whereas the Python book, you come out of it able to go through another book. Interesting. Um, I'll look out for that. That sounds cool. Uh, all right, oh, Python, then, Python really quick, 3. Just oh, really quick. In general, if you have something you want to build, and you can find a programming language that, or uh, an example project that's in the language and has kind of already done that, then just go with that. So like I tell people, yeah, PHP rocks, man. Just crank out PHP. Just do whatever works. It's dangerous to say that though now <laughs> these days because there's so like everyone's like, oh, you use PHP. I don't want to touch you. I'm like, you know, like Facebook mm -hmm. runs on PHP. It's yeah, yeah. Awesome. You know, it, you can give me the worst programming language ever and I'm a professional programmer who knows how to make quality and I will make quality code. And you can take the language that's supposed to be the most robust, like say Haskell or Erlang or anything like that, and hand it to like a terrible programmer, and they will turn that stuff into a massive turd. It'll be a very type safe turd, but it'll still be a turd. So the language kind of doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Um, so has your stance on Python 3 changed since you released the book, Learn Python 3 the Hard Way? Uh, no, not really. I mean, so what I did around some of the problems I had, right? And I, and for the background, I wrote a essay where I said I disagreed with um, how Python 3 was promoted, but also what they changed in it, because they didn't really change much. It's not a massive improvement, and they have a, a lot of things that are bad for beginners. 
like five different ways to format strings. I don't know why. It's so strange. Um, so what I did is I just kind of worked around it, but now I don't really feel the direction of Python 3 is really all that good. And I think um, technologically it's not really uh, going anywhere. They seem to have problems with their peps, the way they do their um, the modifying it, even to the point where Guido, he just quit. He got so sick of managing the Python pep process, he just quit. And so um, that's why I'm pushing the JavaScript book. Um, I don't think JavaScript's like a, such a great community, but the people who manage the language are motivated to actually improve the language. So ES6 and ES7 actually make the language a lot better. You see things coming in from TypeScript from Microsoft. They do a lot of work. They're at least trying to make it better, right? And actually make it productive for real programmers. Whereas I see the Python 3 folks are just kind of making it good for them, you know, and like not really caring about what's useful for other folks or, um, or you know, making it faster. Like there's then not a whole lot that they're doing. And they also ignore projects that could help, like say um, the PyPy project, which is Python and Python. And um, they sort of largely ignore that project, even though it's better. It's super strange. Uh, what's your view of the current uh, hiring process that's typical of Silicon Valley right now? Uh, for instance, how many golf balls fit in a bus? I think it's terrible. Um, I actually sort of stumbled onto an idea from teaching folks that I think the best way to sort of test if a programmer is good without making them do fake work is to present them with a debugging problem. So you present them with broken code that you know how to fix and you see how many bugs they can find. Because like, honestly, like I'd say the 70 to 80% of the work that you do as a programmer on a long-term project. So a project that's been around is debugging. Be fixing, fixing other people's shit. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, fixing, refactoring, finding bugs. Um, I'm like, the one thing I'm very, very good at is actually finding bugs. And so I teach my beginners how to do that. Like, um, and then also because I spent so much time learning how to find bugs and debug things, I actually figured out how to sort of try to prevent them. So defensive coding. Um, but the actual way they hire is just lame. Like you hear about all these, all these people who are like super good programmers and then these super do good programmers can't get work because of how to reverse a red black tree or something dumb like that. And you're just like, I mean, who cares? I'll look that up in a textbook, like present me with something that's actually what I'm going to be doing in my day to day work, you know, and debugging is it debugging is a big thing that you do in your day to day work. Isn't like a ninety percent of programming at this point Googling on like Stack Overflow? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. But Googling for what? Bugs, right? So Googling for an error. <laughs> so it's like if you, if you can do that and you can find bugs and you can find uh, problems, then you know you're probably going to be fairly good at a company that's trying to fix their stuff. Especially some of these startups who have terrible code and they need to hire people who can fix it. You know, I can, I can think of tons of startups who. Um, had chances to be acquired and couldn't because their code was so terrible. Uh, I had um, um, an ex that worked in kind of defense and talking to her about the, the nightmare fucking legacy shit that was like around from s fucking decades ago that you would have to like hunt down people to ask them questions for what the fuck was going on. It sounds like a fucking nightmare. Holy shit. It's awful. Yeah. I mean, I sort of get a kick out of that. Like I'm the guy who you hand me a tangled string and I'll sit there for six hours mm -hmm. peeling it apart while I watch TV. I love stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, if I roll, if I'm like, uh, going to use, uh, some project or something like that, or go work at a company that's just totally mangled code, I'm kind of like, Ugh, this sucks. you know, and it's, it's, it's a big skill. And actually I'd say probably this, one of the reasons my, my career has been successful is because like the first thing I do when I work on a project is I hit the, the bug list and I just start solving bugs. Like I just go in and I just do all the terrible crap work nobody wants to do. You should become a video just... game developer, man. There's a lot of companies that could, <laughs> that could use your help <laughs> right now. I would love to learn how to make video games. This thing, artistic skill, but uh, it seems like a lot of background work that I just sort of don't have time to do. Mm -hmm. you, you started getting into art lately, uh, painting mm -hmm. a lot. You've essentially taught yourself and now you're, mm -hmm. let's say, a pretty decent artist. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I basically... Uh, I started teaching myself about six years ago, and uh, I do. Oh, like I didn't. I thought it, I thought it was like a year ago. I didn't know. It's no, not no, no. It's it a while ago. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, not yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I put in a lot of work for it. I mean, I've, I guess I've probably put in like um, three to four hours a day for like five years, you know. And um, I went to a school for a little while, like a kind of crappy uh, classical realism school. Like basically, they're the Nazis of the art world. Like, if you can't draw a sphere perfectly, then they're just like, you know. Do you, do you um, have a, a website with your art? Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's kind of down right now. Zedshaw.com uh, slash category slash art. 
Is this? Yeah, there's some of that. Uh, I would say my Instagram is the best. So Zed Shaw on Instagram. That's where the most of the art is. And then um, I'm kind of revamping it, but Zed Shaw dot art. I actually recorded a bunch of uh, uh, videos of me painting outside. You know, just kind of fun stuff. Um, but Instagram's the best. Zed Shaw on Instagram. Okay. Cool. Uh, any controversial statements you want to say so we can get some extra press out of this? <laughs> Um, I don't know. So it's sort of funny because like what people are like, oh man, that guy's so controversial. I'm like, what about? They're like, he, he doesn't like Python strings. I'm like, wow. Okay. You have a really warped perspective of what's actually like controversial. Like I can come up with way more controversial stuff that happens within the general world. Um, but otherwise, no, I mean, um, I would say about the only thing is just, you know, my views on open source being just, I don't know, after years of trying to do it, I just actually believe that oh, almost every project by the nature of open source is run kind of like fascism and the people who are in it seem to be fascist. The people who run it seem to be fascist. Uh, the marketing behind it is always that way. There's nothing you can do about it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that I've kind of had to deal with and uh, come to terms with myself, you know, being a big open source contributor and supporter. And so now I'm kind of like, um, just wrestling with that these days. Just to be clear, you're still like a supporter of open source in general, right? Or so it's it's funny yeah it's like i have this love hate relationship and a lot of it is now i sort of tell folks like um uh if you do i think right now open source is at like the peak of uh the way it's run currently i think mm -hmm. it's going to change or die and then i also think that um I tell people, look, if you're just looking for experience, it's fine to go and join an open source project and, and contribute, but just keep in mind that they have a tendency to take advantage of people. So get in, get your experience and get out. And then I tell also folks, I'm just like, you know, but you can also start your own projects and you learn a lot making your own stuff, making copies of other people's code and it's more fun and you don't really have to worry about being in a community. I think community is overrated. I think you can hang out with your friends, hack and just make random weird stuff and that's just as good. Tabs okay. or spaces? Uh, tabs or spaces. Ah, I have very specific, easy to argue for spaces. So we, everybody, you're a programmer. Exactness, uh, exactness and specific, specificity is what we do. If we have uh, any sort of uh, discrepancy or ambiguity, it causes problems, right? That's what computers are about. Okay, so tabs are ambiguous. Spaces you are just exact. got rid of half of your potential fans. Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, so. spaces are exact, right? So spaces, if four spaces is four spaces, is four spaces everywhere. But if, if you take some text editors like Emacs and you say, um, oh, my tabs are three, Emacs will try to optimize it. And then you'll end up with six spaces and two tabs. And then someone else will go and open it and like eight spaces and nine tabs. And so spaces only because it's the most exact way to write your code. That's it. Cool. Well, listen, Zed. Are there? Thank wait, you so I'm. Much. I'm sorry, because I'm a total. I'm a total idiot. <laughs> All right. Are there the people concept? that unironically argue? Debate. Are there people that unironically argue for tabs? I mean, like, mm -hmm. it seems like tabs are totally expressionable with spaces. Like, you can use spaces to make tabs, but tabs seem to have yes. problems. Why do people? Is it just because it's simpler to type? Okay, or? I have no idea. <laughs> like, okay. So for me, it's totally practical. I super don't care. But I know every time I get a, a file with tabs in it, it gets mangled. Yeah. So I'm just after years of like getting files with tabs that get mangled. I'm like, dude, just do spaces. And they're like, and remember what I tell you, a lot of people who join open source projects are sort of like these insecure narcissists. So they want to be like, you know, it's all about me and my text editor and I have to have 9.5 spaces for my tabs or else I'm going to go cry. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Just, just, you work with other people, just use spaces and no, they have huge issues with it. Big debates. I'm kind of like, I don't care. I got, I'm going to go do some painting or something. Okay. What else, Dan? Okay. Anything else? Are we good? Is that it? No more questions? Oh, no. You have any, you have any politics stuff you want to bring up, Says, since we're here? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Okay, good. <laughs> you don't want to do politics, man? No way. No, there's a lot of that happening. No. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to... I'm. We've already lost like half of our audience. I think we have like a quarter of the initial one You know, with everything we've done so far. First off, we yeah. pissed off fascists. Now we're pe people who like tabs, so we're <laughs> down to a few people now. That's all right. <laughs> All right. Well, look, Zed, I want to thank you for coming on. This is a, kind of the first episode on this new channel here. We're trying mm -hmm. a thing, and I appreciate you hopping on, and I think we had a good discussion, and hopefully we can have you back soon. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, maybe if we start an investment podcast, you can get money for your hiring out work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'd have to be I'd have to be less controversial and and play the game to get in bed. So uh, maybe uh, I'll wear a suit next time and I'll be on a stage and we'll do it that time.
Cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming on and uh, cheers. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks Again, for joining right, us. Thank you. All right.